actually uh, sort of like a jar and lid system uh, but it was it was not very good it wasn't airtight so a lot of people that used his system actually had food poisoning afterwards because it didn't actually keep out any spoilage so it really wasn't it was the beginning of it but it wasn't the best idea and then along came another gentleman an Englishman and his name was um, what was his name just a second his name was uh, oh, sorry, Ap uh, Nicholas Appert was the Frenchman, and the Englishman was Peter Durand, and he was 1810, and he came up with a tin can system where you could actually can things with an actual tin can. But it wasn't until we had a wonderful guy called John Landis Mason, inventor of the mason jar, who came along in 1858 and developed a patent for what we now know as the mason jar. This guy was only 26 when this patent went through. This is pretty amazing when you think about how young he was and he came up with his patent for the jar. And it was, a good, it was a good system. It really actually did work. It kept the air out. But that's what you want to do is keep the air out so there's no spoilage. But he wasn't satisfied. He wanted to improve it. So a year later, he puts another patent in for a better kind of a lid and a better kind of a seal. And then he puts a patent in for rubber gaskets that are going to fit his jars. And then he went to a manufacturer and, and started to get the jars made. And then... Way, we, way he went at that point, it was fantastic. People started using the jars from that time on. When it really took off though, was 1885 when the Ball Company, five brothers called Ball, uh, started to manufacture his, um, his, from his patent. The, this, the really sad thing is, unfortunately, is that Mr. Mason never really made a lot of money off his invention. Like everything else in America, especially when they put a patent in, doesn't mean they benefit from it. Everybody else comes along and tries to rip off the patent and do other things. So he, sadly, didn't make much money. But when the Ball brothers came along in 1885, they made sure that they licensed from his patent. So his heirs got some of the money, at least, which is something. Um, and they went ahead and, and started to do the, the Ball jars, which are almost as face, famous as Mason jars, because we, we always think of Mason jars as the, as the standard. But if you look at the, at the grocery stores and the hardware stores now, what you find a lot is the Ball canning jars. And if you go on the website for ball canning, you will see a fascinating uh, little blurb on how you can tell how old your ball jar is based on the signature on the bottom of the jar. Like if it has a, a loop on the end or something, it means it was between 1885 and 1901 or something. It's just fascinating. I actually have a ball jar at home and I went to look at this and my ball jar is from 1923 apparently. So I'm like, this is very cool. So if you wanna see how old your ball jars are, just go on the website and have, there's a way of showing you there. So anyway, that's just a little sidebar. But, after 1885, the, uh, the Ball brothers made it really easy and really cheap to be able to can. And so uh, they realized that these were great jars that could be reused. And that was the whole key to it. It was reusable jars. And uh, the rings were reusable. And all you, uh, the seals were All you had to, to replace with the rubber rings sometimes. Or some of them would last for a certain length of time. Then you'd have to replace them. So then farm women got on big time and started doing this canning. As did city women who had small gardens and, or, or access to markets. So this became a huge, huge thing. And then, you know, as there became a drift to the city and women started, and some women started working, uh, then it was like, oh, who has time to can? This is very, very time consuming. Because anyone that's ever done any amount of canning knows it is very time consuming. And uh, it does take a long time. And it's hot, because most of when canning is done is in the summer, let's face it. And in fact, if you think about uh, the whole concept of a summer kitchen, but the whole idea is to keep the heat out of the main part of the kitchen. Uh, canning is the perfect thing to do in a summer kitchen because you're doing it in a separate, separate self-contained space, but it's still a really hot process. So a lot of women started to say, oh, who really wants to do this? You know, we'll just, there's so many things available now in the shops. We can get canned goods in the shops. We can get jarred things in the shops. Why should we have to do it ourselves? Well, what then got it back into popularity was World War I. And then, of course, the Depression, and then World War II, where it was, certainly in World War I, if you would can at home, then we could send the canned goods over to the troops, was the idea. So you were doing a patriotic thing by canning at home. And then, of course, in World War II, of course, the Victory Gardens, again, you were, you were helping the boys overseas if you would do canning at home. So then it sort of fell out of favor again in the 50s and 60s. Women were like, 
Who wants to do that? It's hot and old-fashioned. I don't want to do that. And then what brought it back again was the Back to the Landers in, in the 1970s. Women wanted, people were going back to communes and going back to the farms. And one of the things they wanted to do, they started knitting again and crocheting and macrame and canning. And now people are canning again because they want to know what's in their food. They want to know what additives are there. They want to know what's, uh, you know, what's actually in there. Dum, 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 dum. Bum, 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 bum.